searching for pleasure in doing the strength it will cut like a knife this hard scrabble life I am a log town laborer on the forge and fulling mill. Our flax and our sheep we gather and reap from the rocky fields we till. And we toil from dawn to twilight. We dig for iron ore. We process piles of timber by the sweat of our brows and the sawmill's mighty roar, my mighty roar. It's a hard, it's a hard scrabble life, searching for pleasure, enduring the strife. It can this hard scrabble life. No, I am an Irish worker in the mountain colony, and I served amidst the opulence. And I applied my trade each day. But when my work was over, and I sat all alone, I dreamt about my family, and I was, oh, oh, oh I was so far from home, so far from home. It's a hard scrabble life, searching for pleasure, enduring strength. It will cut like a knife, this hard scrabble life. And I am a current resident of this place in history with acres of land upon my hands how will they remember me it's a hard scrabble life searching for pleasure in doing the strength it will this hard scrabble life. It's a hard scrabble life. Searching for pleasure, enduring the strife. It will cut like a knife. This hard scrabble life. This hard scrabble life. This hard scrabble life. This hard scrabble life. All right, thank you. Um, I'll switch guitars again. I'm known for performing with a bunch of different instruments, a bunch of different instruments because they have a, a, each have a unique sound to them. Some are 12 strings, some of their eight strings and six strings, and some are guitars and some are not. <laughs> All right. So, um, in the town of uh, Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and this was in the news about three years ago, international news actually, there was, there stood the oldest living white oak tree in America. It was 619 years old. 
and uh, it stood in the Presbyterian ch churchyard, in the graveyard beside the, the church. And uh, it was just the central point of that of that town. And um, it, it was, the, its health was on its way out the last 10 years or so. And it finally was deemed that it had died. And uh, they brought in this huge crane and, and big, big saws with blades on them about you know, nine feet long or eight feet long. They were in, enormous trying to cut this thing down. And uh, news, news cameras came out and there were helicopters taking pictures. It was a big, big production. And I was contacted by a man that uh, was gonna do a documentary film about, about the tree. And he did. It's called Under the Great Oak. And uh, it's, a, it's a really well done film. I really enjoyed watching it. So if you wanna check that out, it's called Under the Great Oak. And uh, Michael, the director asked me to, uh, to write a song that could be included in this documentary. And I thought, well, hmm. I agreed to it. But then when I got home, I thought, how do you write a song about a tree? How do you go about that? Um, and I started to think about the history of this tree and uh, it, it had been uh, documented that George Washington and Lafayette actually picnicked underneath the tree and that, uh, I can't remember his name, but during the early, no, late 1800s, um, one of the foremost preachers in the world actually came and preached underneath the tree. And uh, this tree has seen everything that we have accomplished in this country. It bore witness to, to, to that. And um, what's striking is that when you think about all of our history in this nation, this tree was 300 years old before any of that started to happen. Half of its life was spent just growing in the middle of a forest and uh, the Lenape Indians um, were known to eat the acorns that were produced by the white oak trees. So it's, you know, while it's not documented, I'm sure that they uh, knew about this tree when they were in that area. Uh, and the thing that really struck me about this was about this tree. I was looking at it one night and they had spotlights on it. <clears throat> I was trying to find inspiration in this. And I started to think about the fact that this enormous tree, now I, I can't see all of you online. I can see a, a, a couple of you. Um, so I was gonna ask you to raise your hands if you know that, about the tree that I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> this tree was planted in the middle, well, was surrounded by a cemetery and all of the graves that surrounded it in the immediate vicinity around the tree were from the 1700s and 1800s, early 1800s. And I started to think about burial customs back then. And back then your body was put in a pine box and lowered into the ground and that was pretty much it. There was uh, no embalming at that time that was, that was being done on a regular basis. There were, there were no concrete faults. There were no you know, um, metal caskets they certainly weren't as common as they are now. So what happened is the nutrients from these bodies uh, leached into the ground and I'm sure got into the tree. So this tree, I was looking at it thinking, okay, so the, the old, all the former pastors, some of the former pastors from the church and notable people from town that were buried and you could see their headstones. Some of what some of what made up their bodies are now part of that tree, and that's that was the point where I I thought, okay, I know how I'm going to approach this song. So this song is called Trees, and uh, it is featured on that on that uh, on that uh, documentary film called Under the Great Oak. So if you'd like to check out that movie, it's it's very very well done. You can get it online, actually. This is Trees. Deep in the heart of 
These saplings spring up from the ground. For 300 years, only native Lenape gathered its sacred state. Came the people who sailed across the ocean and settled this town on the hill. The forest was lumbered, but there in the square spared the great book, silent and still. Houses and storefronts, churches and churchyards, rose neath a shadow and shade. Admired and grand, it inspired the living and sheltered our dead in their graves. That's Go in the other room now. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
in the heart of this crawling suburbia, a sopping spring up from the ground. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to uh, move on to a song called The Ballad of Joseph Martin. And uh, <clears throat> some of you may know who Joseph Plum Martin was. Um, he was a, he's known for being a uh, Revolutionary War soldier. And uh, the reason why he's known for that is uh, he joined the Revolutionary Army when he was 15 years old, 15 years old, and he served throughout the entire Revolutionary War, the whole war. And um, <clears throat> towards the end of uh, his life, he did survive the war. He lived it to be um, in his 90s, actually. He wrote a book uh, sort of an autobiography, if you will, a memoir uh, about uh, his life during the Revolutionary War. And he was everywhere. He was everywhere you could imagine. He ended up being there. <clears throat> and uh, the reason why I got interested in this is that he camped with Washington's troops at the bottom of what would be my road when I was a boy. And uh, his book was to his his book original book had this really long title um really I, I can't remember the exact title but it was something like the adventures and exploits of a continental soldier during the war of independence in the years 70 it just it just went on and on and on and uh it was the book was sort of lost to time and history until the 1960s and someone in the Morristown National Historical Park uh, discovered this book in the Lloyd Smith collection of the park. And um, they thought this is a great, great, um, great book that, you know, especially for being in the Morristown National Historical Park, because uh, it tells the story of the Revolutionary War from through the eyes of this soldier, through Joseph Plum Martin. And, um, What's curious about this is that not only did uh, the footsteps of Joseph Plum Martin and I intersect in Burnsville, New Jersey, but I, you know, I'm, I'm coming to you from Maine. I, I am not, oh, I, I moved up here in June of 2019. I'm not new to Maine. I've been, uh, I've been coming here since I was six, six years old, six or seven years old. And my father taught at the University of Maine. Um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, so we have, we have some ties up here. So every year we come up for a month and we come up route one. And I came to find out, oh, I guess about six years ago that Joseph Martin moved up here after the war was done and he had a farm and uh, he worked his farm and he was justice of the peace and he just had a lot of things that, that he did up here. He wore a lot of different hats. But his grave is not a dozen feet off of Route 1, which is the same Route 1 that goes through New Jersey, although it really doesn't look like it up here. It's just a, you know, one lane in each direction. Um, and uh, he would, Sometimes my wife and I think, wow, this is the same Route 1 that is very different in New Jersey. But um, he's buried not 25 minutes from where I'm doing the show right now, where, where I live. So we, seemed, we seem to be sort of uh, in, intersecting through time and space. So uh, this song is called The Ballad of Joseph Martin. And uh, it is also, besides being a song about him, it is also a song that uh, pays honor to our veterans, all, all our veterans. So if you are sitting at home, this is a great song to play when I play at wineries and, and places where people are drinking. There is a place in the chorus where, where it says, we salute our citizen soldiers, raise your glasses high. 
And I usually ask everybody in the audience to salute all of our men and women in uniform, all our veterans out there. So if you have a beverage, a libation with you right now, whether you're sitting on your couch or in your kitchen or wherever, and, and you want to uh, toast our veterans, that would be awesome. Okay? Nice. Here we go. My name is Joseph Martin. I hail from Prospect, Maine. I was raised down in Connecticut, where I learned the farmer's trade. My father was a preacher man, but I took up my gun in the war for independence till that bloody fight was done. Ooh, the bloody war was won. never view in battle and in siege from forest town to Midland, white plains to valley forge swords traders hanged and heroes die as they went to meet their lord Ooh, they went to meet their lord here we go we salute our citizens soldiers the ranger glass is high We salute our citizen soldiers who we'll drink and toast to thee. We we'll suffer for our freedoms preserved for you and me. And surrender came at your town, our victory bittersweet. Settle down near Sandy Point and raise the family. Served as justice of the peace, the farm, the land I own, and recall my veteran brothers and the debts that they were owed. The debts that they were owed. We salute our citizen soldiers, raise your glasses high, and let their homes and families look the devil in the eye. Raise your glass. 
glass is high. We lift their bones and never leaves with the devil in the eye. We salute our citizen soldiers who we'll drink a toast to the eat. We suffer for our freedoms reserved for you and me. We salute our citizen soldiers who we'll raise their glasses high. Thank you. Where do I want to take you next? Let's see. I think uh, I will put this guitar down and I will pick up a different instrument. And I'm going to take you down to uh, Appalachia, down to coal country. I'll tell you a story about down there. Um, I don't know, again, I can't see by show of hands, but if, if you've been to southeastern Kentucky, up in the mountains up there, up in Appalachia, there we go, yeah, um, when um, <coughs> I, was, I was in education for many, many years, I taught history and English. And after that, I became a, uh, a youth pastor and um, assistant minister at the New Vernon Presbyterian Church, if you know where that is. And uh, it's a small church, so I wore a lot of different hats. So I did all the AV work and worked with the kids, and I preached four or five times a year, and, and I would uh, be in charge. I was in charge of community service and outreach and things like that. And I put together this program called Adopt a Family, where People in the area would, we worked with the social worker down in, in a Hazard, outside of what's called Lots Creek, Kentucky. Now, Lots Creek doesn't have the status anymore, but at the time, it, we found the poorest state, which was Kentucky. We found the poorest county, which is Hazard County. And then we found the poorest town in that county, which was Lots Creek. And we worked with a social worker. We chose, uh, we were given names of some families and what they needed, uh, clothes and food and things like that. And we would pack up boxes up here. We'd have families up here that would adopt them. And we'd pack up boxes and we knew somebody who had a truck and they would, we would take the, my youth group down there and we would hand out um, these boxes of things for the families down there. Now. I had never been to southeastern Kentucky before, up in the mountains, up in what's called the hollers. Now, hollers are, I guess, if I were to describe them in geographic terms, um, you know, you have a river that cuts through there, and then all the tributaries through that river, these little creeks and things that flow down through the mountains that over, over the many years have carved out these little valleys and ravines those are hollers and uh, the people who live in them um, when I was doing this work and before that, uh, especially before that, were very tied to the coal industry. They were, they were, um, you know, their, their fathers worked in the coal mines, their grandparents worked in the coal mines and right on back through the generations and people didn't leave their hollers all that much. If you didn't, if you weren't working in a coal mine, that's where you stayed. In fact, when I was putting this program together, I, I found out that down in Georgia, somebody had gotten their master's degree studying people in one particular holler where they still spoke with British accents because people just didn't come. They, 
You know, they stayed, they born, lived, died in that holler and that was it. So uh, I got to learn a lot about the way of life down there and the social worker uh, took me around and showed me just, and, and the kids I, were, I was with, these places that you would not believe existed in America. Uh, if you can imagine, like we, we saw things like a trailer without a floor and just a kerosene stove in the middle. And that was it. That's where they lived in that one room, a family of maybe um, two or three kids and, and a couple, two, two parents, um, or sometimes one parent, sometimes one parent and a, and a set of grandparents. But, uh, you know, the coal mining um, is what has, or the lack of the, the decline of the coal mining is what has uh, really contributed to the poverty down there. And what I learned is that, you know, way back early when the, when the, coal companies were coming in, they made the landowners sign agreements that the coal company could use whatever means necessary to get the coal out of the ground. Now, at the time that they were signing these contracts, uh, it was shaft mining. And you all know what that is, you know, you, basically a big hole in the ground and they lower men down there and they, they tunnel out from there and they, uh, they get as much coal out as they can, and, and that's how they would mine. However, um, fast forward to modern times, uh, now it's strip mining. And what used to take hundreds of men to work at a mine, now it takes six or seven people to strip off a whole mountaintop. And so there is a lot of unemployment and therefore a lot of poverty in that area. And um, <clears throat> the song I'm about to, to sing you called Long, Long Ago is, is about the old timers and, and trying to, you know, make sense about this new way of life and how, how they're not needed in the minds anymore, but they don't know how to do anything else. Uh, they weren't trained for anything else. And uh, on, on a brighter note, uh, there are some people now starting to leave the hollers and come back. And, um, you know, it's funny because if you drive through that area and you see a, what we would consider to be a pretty nice house, those are the teachers. Those are the nurses. Those are the people who work in the hospitals in the areas and work in the schools. Um, they have the money to put up houses that, that are uh, what we would call a, a decent home. Um, but uh, yeah, these stories about what it was like way back when really grabbed my attention. Um, and this song is what came out of that. It's called Long, Long Ago. <clears throat> so let me get a little drink here. There we go. shaft back in 39 long long ago his days were filled with darkness digging in that mine long long ago She knew how long, long ago. She cooked the meals and mended clothes and toiled behind that plow. Long, long ago. Scattered cold from candle loads. 
long, long ago. My job was to maintain the farm we built across that road. Long, long ago. The day the siren sounded, Mama's teardrops rolled. Long, long ago. It took my feet to find the bodies buried in that hole. Done finally laid me down with a cross to call my own. Long, long ago. These hills once filled with anthracite are now filled with miners. I guess, to the end of the 1800s after the Civil War. And grab this guitar again. And I'm going to tell you a story about a, a railroad. Back uh, after the Civil War, you remember back in your history books, um, the big thing from the Civil War on to the end of the 1800s was railroads. And 
people who had, a, you know, a, have, have amassed a good amount of money, there were a lot of little private railroads that started up across the country. And one of them was right here or there, I should say, in New Jersey. And uh, it was called the Rockaway Valley Railroad. And if any of you have gone up to Oldwick to pick apples in autumn, you may have gone to Mellick's Farm. It's right in Oldwick. I think there's one up in Long Valley too, and one, one in White House, I believe. And uh, that family, going back generations, Mr. Mellick was the person that started this Rockaway Valley Railroad. Now, Mr. Mellick, being a businessman, wanted to cut his costs as much as he could. And so what he did was he started buying with the engines and the cars and things like that that he bought for his railroad. He didn't buy them new, he bought them used and, uh, and used them. The track went from an area called Watnung, which is just north of Morristown and made its way through Morristown and Mendham and Gladstone, uh, Pottersville and ended in White House. And it was built by Mr. Mel Melick, by Mr. Melick to move his peaches, his peach crop. That was the primary reason why he built this. Um, he also, to cut costs, he would sometimes, now everybody's seen a railroad track and you know that underneath the ties and the rails is a road, a bed, a railroad bed, crushed stone and, and gravel. And you do that so that water will drain out from underneath the tracks and, and uh, you won't have any problem with frost and, and things like that. Well, Mr. Mellick decided that on some of his stretches of track, he put the track directly on the ground. And uh, you can imagine that when, when the snows would come and frost and things like that, the, the tracks would heave. He also, um, and I don't remember what this is, but there's a certain distance that you need to have between the railroad ties, a minimum amount of distance between the railroad ties to stabilize your tracks. Well, he pushed that envelope a lot and he set the ties often much further apart than they were supposed to be. So uh, the railroad started and his first year, uh, I guess was uh, not bad, but then there was a peach blight and all the peaches that he was hoping to move on his railroad, all of a sudden there were no peaches. So he had to get inventive and, and creative. And so he started hauling things like lime that was mined up in uh, Northern New Jersey and coal. He started carrying that and moving that on his rail line. And he also was forced for economic purposes to, uh, to open it up to passengers. Now it was the passengers that would ride on the train and they would say that because of the, the, the way the track was built um, incorrectly and frost heaves and things like that, he, they said that there were times when the cars would just rock back and forth violently, pretty violently. And so they gave the railroad the pet name of the uh, Rockaby Railroad. And so uh, when I moved to Pottersville, New Jersey, I lived on Black River Road on the Somerset County side, because Pottersville is, has a river that runs through it and Morris County is on, no, I'm sorry, uh, Hunterdon County is on one side and Somerset County is on the other. So we were on the Somerset County side and my house um, looked out on the road directly that, in that spot, that's where the track used to cross for the Rockaby Railroad. And uh, I did a show in Pottersville once and I had a woman who came up to me afterwards and she said, she told me this tale and she said, have you heard about the ghost of the Rockaway, of the Rockaby Railroad? And I said, no, a, a ghost from a train? She goes, yeah. She said she was, and she was totally honest about this. She said, there are folks in town that believe that they hear a train in the woods along the river where the track used to run. And there's no track there anymore. The last piece of track uh, was torn up years and years and years and years ago. Um, 
but you can hear a train, she said, in the woods at times. So I thought, well, that, that would make for a pretty good song, right? Wouldn't you know it? So I wrote this song. And after the song was written, it's actually on, on my first record, Welcome to the Past. Um, but after that record came out, uh, they did some work on a bridge on Black River Road. And it was, it was great for people in town because they could walk on, on the road without worrying about any traffic at all. Kids would play on the road because it was closed. And it was, it was great. So my wife and I were walking our dogs once down Black River Road, and it was getting a little dark. Um, and we we're coming up over this little hill beside the river, and all of a sudden she looked at me and she said, do you hear that? And I said, yeah. It sounded exactly, I'm not kidding you, sounded exactly like a steam train down by the river, that chugging sound that, that steam locomotives make. And we heard it for maybe 15 seconds or so, and then it just vanished away. And I, honest to God, I don't know what it was, but I think that whatever it was, that that's what people have been hearing from time to time. And that's how this story has, uh, has uh, evolved, I guess. So this, uh, this song is called Rockabye, and it's, to it's told from the perspective of the one of the engineers that used to ride, used to drive for the Rockabye Railroad. And there's some terms in here that I think I'll tell you about just so you, you don't wonder what they are. But uh, when I say push the steam, that means increase the speed. That's a railroad term. Um, there is a, a place in here where I talk about the Indian Valley Line. Um, Railroad engineers thought that when you went to heaven, that the railroad in heaven was called the Indian Valley Line. So that's that's what that reference is about. And so, uh, without any more ado, this is this is the song called Rockabye. <laughs> Rock a bye, rock a bye, rock a bye. 
I'm going to move on to a story that, uh, well, one of my favorite stories to tell, actually. <clears throat> and it takes place in uh, the Great Swamp in New Jersey. You know where the Great Swamp is? So the Great Swamp is uh leave this mic for a second. The Great Swamp is a uh, huge wetlands area and uh it is located roughly between Morristown and Basking Ridge and New Vernon and on the other side Chatham Township and Long Hill Township. And now it's either, you know, it's the Passaic River runs through it. And on one side in Somerset County, it's the uh, Lord Sterling Environmental Center. And on the other side, it's a National Wildlife Preserve. And there have been lots of stories that have been associated and historical uh, events that have been associated with the Great Swamp. Um, in the uh, 1700s it was an area where Lord Sterling had his estate. Lord Sterling was a general for the Revolutionary uh, Army, for the Continental Army. And um, he, uh, he was not known to be that nice a guy, actually. He got, he got the title Lord Sterling. He went back to Scotland to try to get the title Lord, uh, but they didn't think he was worthy of it. So he came back to America and, and gave himself the title. Uh, but he had a huge estate there, and uh, it's now there's nothing left now except for some brick outbuildings that were thought to be storage uh, storage uh, houses. Um, Lord Sterling actually was one of the uh, people in the north who had during the time had had slaves because um, there was slavery in, in New Jersey here and there at that time. Also on that same piece of land in the Great Swamp, there was a mastodon skeleton. Yeah, the big, you know, from prehistoric times, mastodons. A mastodon skeleton discovered there in the 1920s. Um, it has been used for farmland. It has, it's now a natural preserve, uh, but it's also uh, sort of a mysterious area. The Jersey Devil has been reported to be seen there over the years, uh, but the, the most fascinating story that I feel that comes out of there is the story about uh, people seeing the ghost of a headless rider on a horse. And he's known as the Headless Hessian. Now, whether you believe in that or not, that story actually traces back to an actual event that took place, historical event that took place um, <coughs> between Berners Township and Long Hill Township uh, when three Hessians were riding through that area. Now, Hessians were, if you remember, were German soldiers. They were German mercenaries that were paid to fight for Great Britain. And they were hated. Uh, people in the colonies uh, hated the Hessians more than they hated the British. Uh, and so three Hessians were riding through town and they were attacked by townspeople. Um, and uh, they were all killed. The, the, all the three Hessians were killed. Their horses died of wounds as well. And uh, one of the Hessians had his head almost severed from his body and his horse carried the body off into the, into the uh, swamp. Uh, I guess the townspeople went to look for them uh, eventually and they found the horse that had died of its own wounds but they never found the headless Hessian. And, since then, people have seen, right up to present day, have seen uh, a headless rider on a horse. I have a very good friend who used to teach with me, uh, used to teach at Far Hills Country Day School in Far Hills, New Jersey. And uh, James was his name. James was a science teacher. He came out from um, California, had spent his whole life in California, came out here, was so enamored by the different landscapes that he saw in New Jersey that he didn't see, didn't know from California. And he decided to go on an owl walk one February in the Great Swamp. Um, they have owl walks in February during a full moon, not because it's spooky, but because that's when you can see the trails the best during a full moon. And February, because that's when 
uh, the owls mate. And you can hear them calling to each, each other from the trees. So he and his friends decided to go. And they, I guess there were about four or five of them. And uh, these are not little kids. These are kids and these are, these are people in their late 20s that were out there. And they couldn't make it on the night of the owl walk. So they decided to do something that I don't, I don't, and I don't advise you to do. They did their own owl walk the next night. The moon was still quite, you know, as bright. And uh, they got trail maps and they parked in, in the gravel parking lot and they walked in and they got about a quarter of a mile in and there was a fork in the trail. And so they stopped there naturally just to take their maps out and open them up and look at them to decide which trail they were going to take. And when they looked up, James said there was this, what seemed at the time to be an oversized black horse, a dark horse in front of them with a rider on top and the rider had no head. And James and his friends didn't know what to do. They, they were like transfixed in fear. They didn't know what to make of this until the horse, James said, went like this and, and shook its head. And all of those guys, James said, they ran out of there screaming like little girls back to their car, just ah, back to their car. And they just took off out of there and they made a pact that night. They said, don't tell anybody about what we saw because they'll think we're crazy. And so they didn't tell anybody. And so um, that October, James was at a friend's house and he was looking through New Jersey magazine, uh, New Jersey monthly magazine. And there was a story in there about the headless Hessian of the great swamp. And James was, you know, it's like, that's what we saw. And, and he felt, you know, vindicated because other people had seen this thing. And I have actually in, 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 uh, interviewed three people who have seen this and they all report pretty much the, the same thing. Now, when I say headless horseman or a headless rider on a horse, you think of the headless horseman probably and the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And what I found out in my research when I was writing the ghosts of Central Jersey is that, is that Washington Irving had friends in the Morristown area. And Washington Irving came down often to see his friends, but also to come down here to do research about Washington's encampments up in Jockey Hollow. And at the time of Washington Irving's life, um, some of the documents were held in the Presbyterian Church on the Green in Morristown. And there are literary experts who believe that when Washington Irving was down here, he heard this local story about the headless Hessian of the Great Swamp thinks what a great story, takes it back with him to Tarrytown and uses that as the basis for writing uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is arguably one of, if not the most famous ghost story to come out of um, American literature. What's also in interesting is that in the churchyard, in the cemetery behind the Presbyterian Church on the green in Morristown, it's a it's a very nice cemetery and it was the place where a lot of prominent wealthy people were, were, were buried and other people too. But uh, for example, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ford who had the Ford mansion um, where Washington made his headquarters, they're buried there. Lots of other prominent people from the area. And if you go to the middle of this cemetery, a cemetery where it's likely that uh, Washington Irving strolled um, there are two headstones side by side, right in the middle of the cemetery. One is broken off in half, but on the bottom of each stone, it says purchased by Ichabod Crane. So not only do you get the story coming from here, but you may get the lead character from this area as well. So I thought that anybody who is looking for their head for 240 years needs to have a song about them. And this is a song called The Horseman, which you'll find on my Providence record. Turn up the lights for this one. Okay.
Well, don't you believe this one bad night? I found a sea of dreadful sight. Hessian soldier long since dead. Looking for his missing. Hessian soldier long since dead. Searching for his missing. In the revolutionary war, townsfolk sent him to his grave. His wandering soul was never saved. Townsfolk sent him to his grave. His wandering soul was never saved.
And that's the story of the, hawk, the, the horseman. I'm going to wind up with one more song here for you guys. We're growing a little short on time. So I'm going to leave you with a uh, leave you with a lu lullaby. And uh, this is a last minute addition uh, to my most recent uh, Grammy balladed record, Eider Down. Um, I wanted to, uh, to write, I've always wanted to write a lullaby that could be sung by anybody who loved someone else. So it, it doesn't have to be from mother to child. It could be from father to child, from brother to sister, you know, whatever it might be. Um, husband to wife, wife to husband. Um, and uh, the record was completely in the can until I, I called Eric, my producer, and I said, I've got one more song for you. And uh, it's called Dreams. And I'd like to do it for you now. And uh, I think it's a fitting way to end, uh, end a show in the evening. And uh, you can curl up in your bed and go to sleep. Everybody. Thank you uh, for having me into the Holland Township Library via Zoom tonight. Uh, really enjoyed my time with you. Maybe sometime in the future I get to be in person. Can't wait to do that again. And uh, I wish you all um, health and uh, happiness and, and peace. But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. What a great way to start the new year. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I don't know if people have questions or something like that, but uh, if they do, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Yeah. 
We'll say that if you want to get uh, more information about me and go to my website, which is gordonthomasward.com, you can do that. And uh, I have a mailing list and you can learn about my books and my music that way. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight in your own home. <laughs> have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. You're Bye. welcome. Thank you. Thank you.